sir, start. Right. Uh, so, would you uh, take up? Yes, we welcome. Uh, we welcome everyone to this uh, webinar today on ultra ultra wide field imaging by Optos, and I would request uh, Dr. Uh, Debashish Bhattacharya sir, who is also the past president of All India Ophthalmological Society, to take over. Thank you, Namrata, and uh, it's been a very good uh, experience with Optos so far, with us and uh, with our uh, chain of hospitals. So uh, I'll be briefly talking on uh, the ultra wide field imaging in uh, the Disha group of hospitals. So uh, greetings from Disha hospitals. Uh, actually, it was a wonderful uh, uh, human story where Douglas Anderson's five-year-old son went blind in one eye because of retinal detachment, which was not detected early and the treatment was late. Although he was having regular eye exams, uh, Mr. Douglas felt that probably in a child, it was very difficult to examine children holistically. And uh, so he went out seriously. He is an inventor uh, engineer from Scotland and uh, he resolved and what this result yielded in this 25 years was that is in front of you. Uh, our experience with Optos started way back in 2012. The, as you see in 2011, Daytona was introduced. Uh, so that is when the technology really crystallized. And now moving forwards, they have a wonderful partner with them, with them. that is Nikon. So this is uh, the entire thing, but uh, going by uh, the technology, it is so uh, wonderfully conceived that uh, you have an ellipsoid mirror and which produces a low intensity lasers uh, into a virtual scan point in front of the pupil. And from there on, it can image 200 degrees of the retina, which is <coughs> itself such a wonderful idea. So, uh, I mean, they use three wavelengths, the blue, green, and red. The, for surface vessels, it is for the blue, for the retina, and the inner layers, it is the green. And for the deep choroidal structures, it's the red uh, low intensity lasers. Now, this is the ellipsoid mirror, which is placed in front so that the laser, these low intensity lasers can form that virtual point and then go in to scan 200 degrees of the retina. And uh, then they are taken up by high resolution and high capacity detectors which actually collate and form the image. I'm not a technical person, but it's a wonderful idea. One thing that occurs that when you're using an ellipsoid uh, uh, mirror and you're reflecting it and you are actually imaging an ellipsoid structure, which is the retina, there will be noises and uh, distortions in the periphery, but they have sorted it out. And uh, this is the great thing about it. And so we get so crystal clear peripheral imaging, ultra wide field imaging of the entire retina. So the journey became with a very sad story, but Mr. Anderson took it up positively and brought in to us a solution. And that solution is evolving by the day. We have a host of retinal surgeons, Professor Mangat from PGI Chandigarh, now with Dr. Grewal's Institute, Dr. Chaitra Jaydev from uh, Netra, uh, uh, Narayana Netralia in Bangalore. We have uh, Dr. Jacob Chang from the Eagle Eye Center in Singapore. We have Dr. Park Rana from uh, Netralia Super Speciality in Ahmedabad. And we have uh, Dr. Devdulal Chakraborty from Dishai Hospitals who will be speaking 
just after me on our Optos experience. <clears throat> so, in short, what Mr. Anderson finally realized that something which was which seemed as a impossible technologically and technically was resolved, but we probably felt that it is clinically unnecessary. At this point, I would make a comment that the most users of this technology are the chain optical or the opticians because they are getting a retinal specialist in their uh, optical dispensing in their optical examination so they they are the biggest uh, users of this technology so though we may see think that it is clinically unnecessary uh, it has a wide scope and uh, therefore if it is thought clinically unnecessary by the doctors it probably would doom commercially but with the initial struggles i think now nikon would confirm that there are more than 10000 units or even more installed world over so this is one thing uh, some uh, staff of ours bought their pet rabbit and the imaging is so easy that our technical people could image a rabbit's retina. Just hold it, schedule it, and put it in front of that device, and it gave this picture to us. So the image is so simply done and probably takes less time than a good indirect ophthalmoscopic examination done with the most experienced hands with the advantage of documentation, which can be used for follow-ups and for patient counseling. So there's a wide scope. And of course, there are other retinal implications, which my retina friends will tell us. So we do Optos as a screening tool for many things. All myops, we advise that on first visit, have a peripheral retinal evaluation with Optos. We tell the retinal doctors can also do it. As Chaitra is busy in, his, in her Saturday clinic in Bangalore, so retina specialists are busy. So this is a useful alternative where we can uh, screen every myopic retina. And we do that in Disha. So then we can follow up the retinal lesions. And myopia greater than five, as we all know, are risky. And therefore, we follow it up frequently. All myopes before cataract operation or yak capsulotomy, we do follow it up. And also after operation. And all <coughs> after uh, a myopic uh, cataract surgery, we follow it, follow them up regularly with Optos. All cases of flashes and floaters in Disha goes through Optos. And then, of course, as you decide, as the retinal surgeons decide on prophylactic laser treatments, they are documented, and after laser, they are followed with Optos. And of course, the other eye of retinal detachments, family history of retinal detachments, they, these patients fall under a category where they are frequently followed under the Optos screening. And of course, uh, we will be discussing many more modalities where the retina surgeons find it useful, this ultra wide field imaging. And uh, so that is the entire gamut. Now, how we evolved, the first reason was, I tell you, uh, in February 2012, after we went to the American Academy, we saw this equipment. I did my own optos, and then I was fairly convinced. And uh, because the retina surgeons are so busy, I thought that you know we should buy this because we have so many myopic patients whom, in a busy comprehensive care, we do not give them a uh, full comprehensive retinal evaluation. So that was in eight years back telling our experience of DX200, which can also do angiography. We there's something called a polygon. We have changed it thrice. It costs us with the person who comes from outside, from China, people used to come. And it costed us $6,000. We did it three times. That was the entire maintenance on this equipment. It's still functioning. We do our angiographies, peripheral angiographies with this machine. 
then in we bought two machines uh, in march two, 2014 and these are hospitals which see more than 500 patients so they also the daytonas have been working for 6 years mostly hassle free we have our technical in charge has been trained uh, by optos and in australia and he can um, uh, identify defects and if any replacements are required it it is done so uh, i thank the entire sequence of optos the first was biomedics from whom we bought the dx200 the next daytonas were bought through alcon then it was from optos plc directly and now nikon has come through which we have bought these two daytonas so currently we have a 24 uh, machine year experience of this ultra fine ultra wide field imaging and uh, this is how our stats go like in barakpur we have almost had close to uh, 100000 uh, optos examinations uh, in durgapur we had 32000 in sharapuli about 28 30000 and these two machines are new and also hit by covid as you understand so uh, these will pick up as time goes so uh, I mean, we are just saying that, you know, how many patients do we see? I mean, almost 10% of the patients, as is obvious, uh, do come to hospitals for power checkup. So we picked up how many patients we have in Barakpur, 24,000 myopic patients who have powers of minus one and above. So about 300, um, 3,000 patients for 3,000 patients of floaters and about uh, 1,500 patients uh, who had diopters below uh, 18 on uh, for cataract surgery. So in Durgapur, which is almost half of Barakpur, the figures are only half. So in Sharafuli, again, the figures are almost half uh, in every of these peers. Then we had this instrument in Gorihat, then which had a neighboring branch called uh, as Behala, so these two combined would yield a reasonable figure because we make, have to make it this equipment viable also. And now we have picked up a new town which covers for these centers and this is the entire gamut of what we do and uh, how many optos comes out of it. Till now I think we have done more than uh, 3 lakh optos uh, screenings. So another useful thing is during COVID time, we use this, uh, you know, cling flames, which are very inexpensive for every case. It takes about a one minute to do this thing. And uh, the patients are safe from, you know, whatever contaminations that you may say. So you just stick it on and uh, make a central opening so that you can do the imaging properly. And uh, I, uh, this is quite patient friendly. So this is one thing we wanted to share with you. Having said that, you know, that Mr. Anderson said that it is, we have to decide whether it is clinically useful. We have to decide whether it is commercially viable. Well, I do understand this very much that cost is a very important part of quality. And, but if we can bring costs at, a, at an acceptable level, then, you know, quality overtakes and takes over cost by economies of scale and by the learnings that you have, which is accumulated by the numericals. So I firmly believe that first, we have to give some cost benefits to the patients and then they lap it up and then the thing keeps moving forward. So I'm a very big believer of uh, this ultra wide field uh, imaging system. And uh, we need to simplify it because simplification I believe is the ultimate sophistication 
and this is a beautiful quote that I always is very dear to me from the master. Thank you very much for uh, your listening through the whole thing. Now I will ask uh, our uh, Retina consultant, Dr. Devdulal Chakraborty, to take over and uh, tell us uh, more about how the retinal uh, doctors feel about and what they do with Optos in our institution. Thank you very much for a patient here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. I think your last slide was the slide which said it all that uh, simplicity is, uh, you know, most important thing. Uh, just to go through uh, the formal uh, introductions in this webinar of importance of ultrawide field uh, retinal imaging. I think we've all heard uh, Dr. Devashish Bhattacharya, uh, who's going to be chairing the session and he's set the ball rolling. Uh, he's a person, he's a legend in himself and uh, an institution in himself and somebody who just inspires all of us uh, through the length and the breadth of this country. Founder, chairman of Dishai Hospitals who saw it, uh, who envisioned it when nobody thought that these, this uh, would work. Uh, Dishai Hospitals, a chain of 15 hospitals across West Bengal doing more than one lakh surgeries uh, per year in cataract and other subspecialities, sub including vitro retina, cornea, glaucoma, oculoplasty, sees 15 lakh OPD patients. I'm sure this is much more annually with more than 100 whole time consultants and more than 1000 plus staff. Uh, he's been uh, the guiding force in the All India Ophthalmological Society at various uh, levels, uh, beginning from the chairman of ethics committee to chairman, editor, proceedings, uh, president of All India Ophthalmological Society. And he continues to guide us even now. He's the election commissioner, chief election commissioner uh, for this year, uh, this year's uh, presidential elections. Uh, sir is a regular guest speaker at international conferences. We all know in the domain of hospital management, leadership, capacity building, and he's also actively involved in medical uh, knowledge sharing training programs. Um, not only in India, but also in neighboring countries such as Bangladesh, China, Malaysia, and Indonesia. Dr. Rajesh, uh, would you do the next? Yeah, Ma'am, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Dogra, sir, Professor Mangatram Dogra, who, who, who is a stalwart in the field of retina. He did his MBBS from Medical College Shimla in April 1977 and then uh, did his residency in ophthalmology at PGI Chandigarh. Then uh, he underwent two years Vitretna Fellowship training from July 1989 to June 1991 at uh, University of Maryland Hospital, Baltimore, USA. And uh, his uh, patient care, teaching and research have been mind-blowing. And there are many students of, her, of uh, uh, Professor Dogra who, who are now teachers. And so he's, a, he's the teacher of teachers. His work in uh, retinopathy of prematurity is really very much exclusive. He has published 207 papers in peer-reviewed national and international journals and has several chapters on vitreotin diseases and ROP. He has delivered numerous lectures, more than 1,000, uh, close to 1,000 lectures at various national and international uh, conferences. And he has been invited as guest speaker in various uh, countries as well on ROP and on vitreotinal Topics. He is an internationally recognized expert on ROP, as I said earlier, and he's a former president of the following society, Vitreton Society of India, North Zone Ophthalmological Society, Chandigarh Ophthalmological Society, Himachal Doctors Alumni Association. He's also former treasurer and chairman scientific committee of Vitreton Society of India. He is a former professor and HOD chief of retina services, advanced eye center, PGI Chandigarh, and right now working at Greval uh, Eye Hospital. So we welcome you, sir. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Jacob Chang, who graduated uh, with an MBBS degree from National University of Singapore in 1995 and went on to specialize in the field of ophthalmology, obtained MMED of in 2003 and did his post-graduation uh, from Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh, that is FRCSED. His expertise is in ARMD, diabetic retinopathy, retinal vascular disease, inherited retinal disorders, and diagnostic visual electrophysiology. Uh, and he has a special interest in electrophysiology and has been trained from uh, Morpheus Eye Hospital. So both me and Dr. Chang share 
our uh, fellowship in common, which is Moorfields Eye Hospital. He's been invited to give lectures and teaching workshops at many meetings around the region on areas of medical retina and retinal imaging, and is an adjunct research scientist with Singapore uh, uh, Eye Research Institute, a clinical teacher with National University of Singapore. He has been involved in uh, several pioneering research projects in drugs in collaboration with many international institutions for research and has published many uh, peer-reviewed scientific papers. He's a council member of College of Ophthalmologists Singapore and a member of Mount Alvarina Medical Advisory Board and a key opinion leader for Novartis, Topcon, Zayas, Bayer, Abbott, and Alargan. Uh, we also have with us Dr. Deb, Deb Dulal Chakravarti, who, who did his MBBS at Silchar Medical College, Assam, uh, in 1997, then went on to do DNB, uh, FICO, then Fellowship in Veteran Diseases at Shankar Netral at Chennai. He has performed live surgeries at various conferences, which includes ISOC, OSWB, and uh, various other conferences. He is a senior retina surgeon working at Disha Eye Hospital, Kolkata, and he has received numerous awards uh, like Certificate of Merit for Best Presentation at AIOC 2004, Best Retina Paper at OSA 2008, Best Poster Podium Presentation AIOC 2019, FIFA Award AIOC 2020. He is a terrific speaker and a wonderful academician. We welcome Dr. Devdulal Chakravarti. It is a pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Chetra Jaydev, who is also the Joint Secretary of All India Ophthalmological Society. She is actively in involved in the editorial management, scientific publications, and translational research at her institute and beyond. And she served in the Indian Journal of Ophthalmology as the uh, 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 from 2006 to 2017, and uh, and is the editor in chief of the Journal of Vision Sciences since 2014. And he's she's also set up an ophthalmic image reading center, COIR, at the Institute. She's an alumnus from Bangalore Medical College, uh, she, where she completed her MBBS, post-graduation and Vitro Retina Fellowship, besides another fellowship at Aditya Jyot Eye Hospital in Mumbai. In 2014, she became the youngest candidate to be elected as member scientific committee. Uh, she's an avid researcher with a uh, huge number of uh, publications in the, PubMed, uh, in the PubMed, which are indexed. Uh, and in subjects, interestingly, even beyond her core interest. She has contributed to internationally renowned con textbooks like uh, Myron Yanoff's textbooks on advances in ophthalmology. Uh, and she's one of those uh, uh, breed, you can say, of clinician scientists who are coming up more and more in our country. And she defended her PhD at the uh, Maastricht University, Netherlands. She has to her credit several state, national and international conference presentations. And I know that she's a very active member of uh, Women Ophthalmological Society as well. Uh, she's presently the senior Vitro Retinal Consultant, Naran Netrale Eye Institute, uh, Bangalore. It gives me great pleasure to introduce a young innovator, Dr. Path Rana, who is medical director, retina and ocular trauma surgeon, Netrale Super Specialty Eye Hospital, Ahmedabad. He did his MBBS and MS ophthalmology and then went on to do his uh, fellowship in vit vitro retina from Drishti Netrale. Then he did the uh, fellowship in comprehensive ophthalmology from that place itself. And then went on to do his uh, fellowship in ocular trauma society. Then also various other uh, um, degrees and, uh, and uh, fellowship like uh, hospitalization, VR and ocular trauma at uh, Leipzig University, Germany, under Dr. Peter Widemann. Then he also did his uh, Vitretna Fellowship at Arvindai Hospital, Madurai. He has numerous publications, uh, quite a good number of publications. And uh, at a young age, he has done many presentations in various national and international conferences and has received numerous awards, which includes the innovator and multiple patent uh, uh, holder for RASS Scleral Tap IOL and India's first Ocular Trauma Fellowship under Ocular Trauma Society of India. So uh, he is a young innovator and a very dynamic academician and we welcome Dr. Patrana in this session. So I also welcome our co-moderator, my co-moderator Dr. Rajesh Sena and I think uh, now uh, who actually needs no introduction, everybody knows him. And we can now request Dr. Devudal Chakrabarti to give his experience of uh, 
ultra wide field uh, optos uh, at uh, deshaya hospital uh, i'd like to thank uh, uh, the aios uh, my chairman dr devashish bhattacharya namrata ma'am rajesh uh, sir and of course my regards to uh, mangal dogra sir so i'll be sharing my uh, presentation so i'll be speaking on optos white field imaging and the disha eye hospital experience i have no relevant financial interest in this so uh, to begin with what is ultra white field retinal imaging ultra white field describes retinal imaging into the far periphery in a single capture it is as simple as that so ultra wide field retinal imaging actually the international wide field imaging study group defined what is actually uh, uh, retinal imaging and they defined posterior pole imaging as area of the retina within the major vascular arcades and just beyond wide field was described as centered on the fovea imaging retina in all four quadrants posterior to and including the vortex vein ampullae and ultra wide field where images showing retinal anatomy anterior to the vortex vein ampulla in all four quadrants we at disha because of uh, our uh, chairman sir who actually had the foresight of you know getting the 200 px way back in 200 2012 when and nobody else probably in india had it so we have been fortunate to uh, have of course the fundus camera the basic fundus camera we use the clarus and this is an auto montage with the clarus this is a wide field auto montage with the clarus and of course we have the optos so all these three images are incidentally from the same patient and you can uh, just uh, summarize to uh, you know tell that uh, well the images tell it all so this is the ultra wide field image that is possible with the optos so uh, like uh, uh, my chairman mentioned uh, we had one optos in uh, 2012 and uh, so we have uh, six datonas additional datonas now and of course the optos is capable of of the uh, of the fa the icg and uh, the fundus uh, photo of course and and of course the autofluorescence so with 200 tx autofluorescence and fa and auto and uh, the basic uh, ultra wide field uh, fundus imaging is possible and with the datona the ultra wide field uh, fundus imaging and the autofluorescence is possible so basically we use these two machines so uh, why optos well because it is the only single capture 200 degree ultra wide field image uh, of the retina that's possible uh, in today's world uh, this is the only machine that you know with which you can have a 200 degree wide field ultra wide field image of the retina and the images can be taken through most uh, of the cataracts and vitreous opacities as uh, i will be showing and of course you can use a non mydriatic uh, you know uh, state to take the images uh, as is fast comfortable and convenient for all patients and uh, has multiple imaging modalities and of course it, uh, this is very good for documentation for patient uh, information and uh, also for you know prognosticating your diseases so like uh, has already been mentioned uh, it uses a patented virtual point technology which allows the optos system to produce a single capture ultra wide field image and uh, this virtual point is is actually placed behind somewhere behind the iris plane and uh, this creates a large scanning angle through which you know these images uh, can be taken from inside the eye basically of course it uses uh, three lasers the blue green and the red the blue is actually the one that uses uh, that is used for the surface uh, captures but uh, what here about the green and the red lasers well because uh, uh, this is something that that's interesting and i'll be showing uh, subsequently and uh, these three together the optos uses this three in one color depth imaging so you can actually you know capture a fundus uh, like this a basic uh, normal color fundus so to say in a normal uh, person who's just coming for a screening or it could be something a little more uh, serious with this uh, lattice uh, uh, it's an early lattice that is seen in the suprotemporal periphery here and of course it could be something a little more concerning a uh, break here in the suprotemporal quadrant something little more ominous a large break with a total retinal detachment which needs immediate attention and of course uh the one very important thing that's uh, there about the optos is that you know every point is basically in focus this is uh, actually a spontaneously reattached retinal detachment and you can see a macular hole bang in the center so uh, if you notice the entire image is in focus so that's one of the specialities of the optos 
well you can uh, image uh, like uh, my chairman showed you can image a rabbit's retina so a child is basically child's play imaging a ch child's retina is basically child's play for the optos and you can see this large retinoblastoma which is uh, not uh, very fortunate for this child but it was uh, picked up uh, very early on in the child's uh, uh, you know life and of course here you can see another lesion here so it's it's a tool with which you can image children also now uh, going back to this uh, green and red lasers well you can see a nevus here so with the red laser which which uh, you know uh, captures the choroid basically so you can see the nevus clearly and with the with the green laser it is missing here so therein lies the utility of the green laser and the red laser and going back to our uh, simple lattice here you can see the red laser has not really picked it up whereas the green laser has picked it up so you can actually utilize these uh, to actually locate uh, or find out your area of interest now you can also have these asteroids which are so often in in uh, while we notice uh, them so often in retinal examination and you can play around with these uh, you know blue green and uh, red uh, lasers and you can actually get an image and get to know what the retina is uh, like now uh, let's look at this patient this is a young child with a uh, corneal opacity having a cataract which is partly subluxated and uh, so you can you can see this is this is a fun retinal detachment uh, and this is in fact a printout from a printout of the optos that i have i'm showing this just to show that even the printouts with the printouts also you can kind of uh, you know clearly vis visualize what's going on and this is of course post surgery when of course the cataract was taken care of so the image is much much better here you can image uh, peripheral retina you can image peripheral lesions and with the optos fa this becomes even more uh, better and you can know the uh, complete extent of the disease and of course the feeder vessels uh, are made visible and you can plan your treatment the optomat map fa or the optos fa actually has a resolution of 14 microns and uh, you can magnify any area of interest to find out what's going on now uh, uh, showing you just a couple of practical uses of the ultra wide field fa so this is a 55 year old lady with recalcitrant diabetic macular edema after umpteen number of injections when she presented to me actually i thought uh, that there could be some peripheral ischemia so we did this uh, optos imaging and actually we could find out uh, plenty of areas of peripheral ischemia which had not been well covered with the laser and so we did laser and in two months time she did better without any more injections so actually uh, this uh, is an important area which we have to look into of course uh, dogra sir will be speaking on uh, uh, uveitis and uh, of course you can image vasculitis with the optos and uh, uh, going back to the retina uh, this is a vr view and you can actually see how much of a uh, ischemia is there and whether to do laser or not or whether to let it go you can decide with this uh, optos images so everybody likes to have a good view uh, uh, but this view is definitely better than the one previously uh, shown so it's the same for the retina let's look at this this is an 80 year old uh, gentleman with sudden decrease of vision the visual acuity was hand movement and this is what uh, our conventional uh, fundus camera would show us but actually if you look at the optos the whole story is actually uh, in front of you so we have a very very large subretinal uh, hemorrhage and of course exudative retinal detachment and all this was captured with through this small people this is the intraoperative actually uh, capture of the pupillary size and this is uh, something that we did this on this monday itself and uh, through this small people also you can get a picture like this so of course we remove the subretinal uh, blood from this uh, through a temporal retinotomy and we realize that there was a large rp rip and uh, then this is day one post up this is on this tuesday last tuesday we could uh, capture this large uh, you know rp rip that was uh, possible to uh, uh, see with this um, autofluorescence ultra white field autofluorescence with the optos so this was on day one so basically the ultra wide field autofluorescence captures the retina using fundus autofluorescence and green laser of 532 nanometers and what's interesting is that uh, when you do a autofluorescence both the color and the autofluorescence image can be you know carried out in one exam itself so here is an example this is the color image and this is uh, the baseline image and uh, this patient has developed a rp rip and we can follow it up 
So uh, of course, uh, this uh, can be used in UV-itis cases. I won't go in really into UV-itis and you can uh, uh, zoom them up and uh, see your area of interest. And of course you can document patients with retinitis pigmentosa, et cetera, and know the full extent of the disease. It's a wonderful tool for documentation. And when we've published a few of these uh, interesting pictures, this is a toxocara granuloma with uh, a larger retinal break here and a total retinal detachment that was noted on Optos examination. And this is a bilateral congenital retinal fold. And as you can see, right from the disc to the temporal periphery in both these eyes, uh, the right and the left, you can uh, note that the congenital retinal fold is uh, visible, it's in focus. And even the other parts of the retina are in focus uh, with, the, with the Optos image. We also recorded this uh, uh, scleral fistula in a aborted bridge coloboma, and we published it in the Indian, Indian Journal of Ophthalmology recently. And uh, this is one of the few uh, uh, documents that we have about scleral fistula. And uh, of course, the Optos captured it all. It's very important to you know, have a proper you know, uh, tool to examine the patients and explain to the patient what's happening because this is a patient, this is a physician who presented to me having undergone uh, a VR surgery elsewhere in a diabetic uh, you know, vitreous hemorrhage. And as you can see in this picture, there's uh, silicon oil uh, in the eye and there's a large uh, tractional retinal detachment with this uh, you know, attraction here. So we operated on him, released the traction and uh, postoperatively, we could show him that the traction was gone and the retina was settled. So we also published this in, this in the Indian Journal of Ophthalmology. And it's very important to actually document what's happening and what you've done to the patient. Then we have a lot of skeptics uh, coming to us. Uh, for example, all of us have these uh, uh, patients, uh, both male and females, uh, with floaters. And uh, you can just uh, you know, show them this uh, fundus image or with the optos and tell that everything is OK and they did not worry. But then we have also other patients who do not believe that they have a problem. Let's take this gentleman, for, for example. This is a 35-year-old with flashes, having 6 six vision, wouldn't believe that he had something serious. But when the optus was done, he realized that, of course, indeed, there was something serious. There was this subclinical RD with numerous breaks, which needed immediate treatment. So there are a lot of patients who come to me uh, asking whether my laser has been done all right. So the Optos, you know, says it all. And you can tell and uh, save a colleague from, you know, um, uh, other uh, issues and say, showing that the laser has been done all right. So this is an 80 year old uh, with sudden loss of vision and with a history of blunt trauma. And we could, you know, show him this IUL that had dropped inside the, uh, you know, vitreous cavity and was lying on the retina and that uh, could explain to him what uh, made him lose his vision. There was this 71-year-old uh, you know, gentleman, post ozodex who noticed a black shadow and he came running to us and we could show him the ozodex right in the inferior periphery and uh, he was you know, kind of satisfied and he understood that this was not something very serious. The Optomap ICG, like I mentioned, we don't have uh, the California, which actually has uh, facilities for Optomap ICG, but uh, uh, this also is a wonderful tool and sh surely we'll be using it shortly. And uh, it can image right up to the periphery and all four vortex ampullae can be seen. And uh, this has been also been noted by the International White Field Imaging Study Group. So uh, uh, these are uh, images through the California. And uh, of course, uh, it has uh, uses in AMD, VKH, and other diseases. And to conclude, Optos is a useful imaging modality with, which, is, uh, which uh, could be utilized in various retinal diseases and, of, of course, in uveitis also. And it obviates the need for contact lens. Uh, pupillary dilatation is not really always essential. The imaging is fast. It offers high resolution and allows the, almost the entire retina to be in focus. But the problems are the initial cost, and often you have these eyelash artifacts, and aura to aura imaging in all quadrants is still, still not possible in one go. So I'd like to thank you all and acknowledge my team at Retinal uh, Department, Dishai Hospitals. Thank you all. It was an excellent presentation, Dr. Dedulal. I mean, why for patients, even for anterior segment surgeons like us, who have not seen, you know, these kind of things for such a long time, Ozudex, IOL, things like that. It was really, the pictures you showed were really amazing. Thank you, ma'am.
so would the panelist like to comment at this point in time or should we move to the next talk sir dr debashi sir okay chaitra next so talk starts ma'am we'll yeah yeah on. chaitra is going to talk on white field imaging for retinal diseases clinical implications and i think we are going to see more set of you know cases on how this optos helps but before you start chaitra i just want to ask one thing it has a 2d kind of a effect and not a 3d kind of a picture so i'm sure there would be some limitations also maybe we can discuss after your talk yes ma'am so good evening everybody uh, it's a pleasure to be part of uh, this uh, forum i've been using uh, daytona optos actually for many years initially it came to us as a study unit and uh, we did a lot of research even with dr sada in uh, the us and then subsequently we formed a study group called as ira and then we went on to do some more studies with the uh, four centers in the south and uh, it was so useful for us uh, both as a research tool and clinical tool and uh, even the patients uh, really liked the way we can uh, describe their disease to them that we our center does have a, a instrument now of our own and uh, and uh, the amount of uh, follow up we've been having for the last 2 to 3 years it's been an amazing tool for us to document these uh, changes and prognosticate it for the patient so i'll be speaking on uh, white field imaging for retinal diseases in particular because the uh, model that we have is the daytona uh, i have no uh, financial uh, disclosure so with the daytona we are basically able to do more of uh, you know the color images and the faf uh, but i don't have the ff uh, and the icc which i'm sure dr dogra will be able to tell us more about so before we actually go into uh, white field imaging let's look at some common things that we see in day to day practice which uh, a lot of anterior segment people would uh, uh, relate with so this is your slit lamp with a 90 uh, diopter lens so this is how much we see and most of our uh, glaucoma colleagues uh, will well understand what i'm talking about next would be our indirect proximal scope uh, you know see we just see about 30 degrees so imagine when you have to look at 200 degrees you actually have to steer the eye you have to steer the patient you have to steer yourself the lens and everything and it's never visible at one view and then you have your fundus camera this is our regular fundus cameras that we use which gives us about 45 degrees and then you have to take multiple images and montage them together then we went on to 100 degree uh, you know some more uh, fundus cameras which gave us a little more view where you see like beyond the posterior pole and the arches but then came the optos which is really ultra wide field imaging and this gives us 200 degrees at one view and uh, like dr debdulal mentioned we can't see aura to aura but you can see at least 80% of the retina and once you steer the eye and you ask the patient to look up down you can actually uh, manage to view the entire retina if not in one single image so what is ultra uh, wide field imaging it basically des describes imaging into the far periphery in a single capture now why is it better than traditional retinal cameras which offer a limited view is that only 4 to 9 image montages are sometimes required to get that much of a view and uh, whereas wider field uh, you know cameras do not have this disadvantage where we have to take multiple images and then montage them which itself comes with a lot of uh, disadvantages montaging will cause some image distortion will cause loss of some important information and sometimes it just doesn't give us all the information that we need whereas this allows us to document over 80% of the retina in a single capture so i uh, this is what i meant by montaging if you can see you have to actually manually do it some instruments do it uh, on their own also auto montaging but it's just not the same these are some of the other images of montaging you can see that the uniformity of the image is lost sometimes the uh, exposure may be different in each one of the captures so we may not able be able to see much therefore uh, we uh, do prefer the optos like uh, 200 degrees in comparison to just about 15 degrees or 45 degrees of view 15 percentage of the retina is seen it can help us get a lot more clinical information and uh, there are a lot of peer review literature now over 800 of them which have described just wide field imaging you can detect diagnose monitor and treat uh, various retinal pathologies and we have also been able to pick up a lot more sight threatening pathologies in the far periphery which may have gone amiss uh, either during routine clinical examination or other imaging so this is the device that we are using and the daytona in particular just uh, brief specifications about uh, this device that we are using uh madam was mentioning that because this is uh, 2d and also it's a curved uh, structure retina 
we may not be actually able to see it due to parallax so there also something called as pro view which solves this problem so this is initially uh, how it helps us is to get accurate measurements across the image even in the far, far periphery and it en enhances the image registration also for disease tracking and intermodality image comparison is uh, possible like i mentioned you have a, a color picture you have faf you have ffa and icg so this particularly helps us also with that so if you look at this this is without pro view and this is with uh, pro view it gives us a better perspective as well so these are some other uh, images that show uh, how you can see it. so this is a good image where you can see the ultra wide field and the extent of the 200 uh, degree images so some of the retinal diseases that we've been able to capture i have divided it uh, disease wise uh, and the common diseases and few uncommon ones as well so dr as we all know is predominantly uh, affecting the posterior pole but off late uh, predominantly peripheral diabetic retinopathy has also come into the uh, you know specialty and we are seeing more and more peripheral lesions which could be made missed with just the etdrs uh, seven field imaging it is uh, uh, price at all i've also shown that with uh, these uh, uh, wide field cameras uh, 90% uh, increase in severity levels can be determined over the etdrs gradient now going on to surgical retina itself you know medical retina is important but when we are planning surgery if you see a picture like this where you seeing extensive uh, you know uh, proliferative diabetic retinopathy extending far into the periphery this is an extremely important tool for us to understand the disease ourselves and to also show our patients to tell them how difficult it is going to be for us to manage the prognosis also can be explained more now this is a patient that i saw it looks you know like you know uh, very uh, ominous when you see it at the first go here you can show the patient now this is why your vision is so low you have a huge uh, uh, you know clot right in the center of your visual field which is why your vision is poor the rest of the retina may look very innocuous to him but then you can explain you can show the sclerosis vessels you can show the proliferative diabetic retinopathy even despite treatment there was progression of the disease and the patient uh, you know progressively lost vision and eventually uh, post treatment he is doing quite well so we can uh, document it serially uh, it's good for our own understanding of the disease and for the patient's understanding so other retinal vascular diseases especially you know where more of retinal periphery involved you know peripheral ischemia and neovascularization can be easily detected even if it's missed clinically so this is a patient that walked into our clinic yesterday with uh, you know crvo it's so easy to explain to the patient you know especially in comparison to the other normal light you can also see astral hyalosis in this patient so you can tell them you see the extent it's going far up to the periphery Uh, so obviously the ischemia is expected to be more eventually the patient would probably need a laser treatment as of now intravitreal injection to manage the macular edema this is a very interesting patient who came with uh, you know just two days post uh, delivery who needed to be uh, induced into labor because she had extremely high blood pressure so you know this is uh, a very severe manifestation of uh, preeclampsia where you can see subretinal fluid serous detachment you can see choroidopathy you can see a lot of these uh, spots of uh, choroidal involvement has just put in one picture the other i had the same manifestation uh, you know especially for a person who has just delivered a baby it's so important to deal with it sensitively but the minute you show her you explain to her what's going on uh, she and her husband were quite uh, understanding of what's going on and important is that these have medical legal implications because the husband asked me one question is this eye manifestation because of anesthesia is that why the my wife has lost her vision or decreased vision in both eyes but here we could explain to them very well and documented it for a uh, future uh, requirement if any inflammatory diseases of the retina extremely useful again because of the peripheral involvement uh, now this is a patient uh, who had uh, syphilis and uh, post uh, you know follow up we kept seeing sclerosis uh, vessels and lot of vasculitis and unfortunately there was also a vascular proliferative tumor which we picked up on follow up as you can see here now this is a patient again with uh, vasculitis you can see the peripheral involvement good educative tool post laser you can see good resolution of the disease this is a patient with uh, serpiginous uh, like uh, uh, choroiditis again uh, extent of the disease can be well delineated here peripheral retinal degeneration retinal detachment as madam was saying it's very very important especially for patients undergoing you know refractive surgery you can document you can show them you can make them understand why we need to laser their retina before we actually take them up for refractive surgery and you know several lesions can be visualized at one go it also helps us in surgical planning here is one patient who came with multiple tears some of them uh, this is actually pvd induced uh, post uh, inflammation so rather unfortunate but we caught it on time could laser the patient 
Now, this is a patient with uh, bullous retinal detachment, and we can show them why it has occurred. We can show these linear tears that the patient had uh, another horseshoe tear. They understand the requirement for surgery. This is post laser again to document, and some subsequently we could show that though one hole was treated, there were some uh, more lesions that needed retreatment referred from another center. So again, to show them, you know, this is important. Then AMD, we always think that AMD only presents in the posterior pole. Why would you need the, you know, periphery to be uh, seen by documented? Now, this is a patient who had a peripheral PCV that we all uh, now are aware of. And uh, post uh, prior therapy, you can see good regression of the disease. This is a patient whom, if you saw the posterior pole, would just think it's diabetic, uh, you know, retinopathy with macular edema. But then again, had an, uh, you know, peripheral uh, PCV like lesion, which again underwent uh, treatment, a middle aged lady. Uh, this was uh, a, a patient who actually, unfortunately, my animation is not working. A massive bleed in the posterior pole. This is on final follow-up today when I saw her. Uh, good resolution of her, uh, you know, hemorrhage, sub-macular hemorrhage. Blood dyscrasia. We see a lot of systemic issues, uh, which we pick up actually in the retina department on the first go. Again, the severity and extent can be determined. This is a patient whom we saw first in our center, uh, eventually investigated to found to have ITP now on systemic management. This is a patient with uh, anemic uh, retinopathy uh, or leukemic retinopathy still under investigation. There were sub elements bleeds. The other eye was already lost. So this eye was either a secondary or a secondary to leukemia and the other eye was lost. So we're still investigating this patient. This is a young intern, uh, an MBBS student who came in like this. She's just 23 years old, came in with this presentation, turned out to have a protein S or a protein uh, C uh, and uh, deficiency, and now she's on treatment. Uh, luckily, the other eye is fine. And if you notice here, I don't know if you can see my cursor, there was also a sm small arterial occlusion, arterial occlusion, which gave us photoma. Now she's definitely getting better with treatment. Tumors, extent, severity. This is a young boy who's already lost one eye. Uh, he has a VHL. You can see the number of angiomas. We literally counted about 12 some of them previously treated. Now, unfortunately, has developed a TRD, has undergone surgery, and uh, Bracky is doing quite well. This is his only eye. This is, again, patients with uh, secondaries. We are able to pick up, and again, uh, like I mentioned, FAS is a good tool here to delineate. These are, again, uh, you know, uh, choroidal mets that we are able to pick up. This is, again, another patient where you can see, uh, you know, feeder vessel, very beautifully demonstrated uh, for a VPT. Very useful in pediatric retinal diseases, especially because they do not cooperate. Those who have red cam, well and good, but even ultra-wide field imaging helps with children. And uh, medical legal issues, sequential documentation, extremely useful. Uh, this is one of the earliest publications of Octos in 2013 itself, where a flying baby position is needs to be adopted and still can be done with rabbits. You can definitely do it with children. And here you can see these, uh, you know, uh, congenital anomalies. This is an unusual case where we saw gyrate like a trophy again in a young child. This is rather unfortunate. The father is a badminton coach, national coach. His child has this. We are unable to actually come to a diagnosis, but you can see the extensive, uh, you know, dysplasia uh, in one eye. The other eye, fortunately, is good enough. This is again a dystrophy in a child, very young child. We could document in, you know, both eyes. Came uh, after visiting several centers. Some rare conditions, as you can see here, uh, presented quite late, looks like a dystrophy. We are still investigating the patient. And this is one most recent patient that I saw, unfortunately, an optic nerve avulsion. Uh, vision is extremely low, but uh, only one eye left. The other eye has auto-initiated. So it is, uh, uh, I'm not saying this just interesting cases. It has also helped us in diagnosis and follow-up. We have done a lot of studies. This was uh, in 2018, again, with Dr. Sada's group, where we could see, uh, you know, automated now. We are trying to do automated, uh, you know, reading of these ultra-wide images so that it helps us in screening. Uh, these are some, and these are some of our recent papers that we published in uh, respective uh, journal where we could pick up uh, peripheral retinal degeneration much better than clinical examination. Uh, so we did the sensitivity and specificity for these lesions. So to conclude, the results of several studies have shown that the results of ultra-wide field imaging does provide similar uh, results to the ETDRS uh, seven field uh, color photograph. It correlates very well clinically as well. Little experience is required actually for imaging can be done by a photographer or by medical care personnel. There's a fast learning curve. It has promise for peripheral uh, screening programs and telemedicine as well because it's very quick. And, you know, it can be done, uh, you know, again in uncooperative patients. 
and uh, to end uh, my thoughts would be the documentation and follow up is excellent it does help me a lot like in this presentation and for my publication patient education tool you know the more said the better non dilating pupils very easy uh, you can steer the eye and get better images non cooperative patients as well pediatric patients like i mentioned confirmation of retinal uh, path pathology in the periphery and also ma minimal uh, limitations are sort of color uh, images that you get and the cost but then uh, my patients are more than willing you know to get an opto done because they want to see their retina so many of them have never seen a retina before in their life and when you say this is a picture of your retina they like doctor can i have a print out of it so whether they're going to frame it or they're going to use it for a you know second opinion i don't know but they're definitely happy with getting uh, their retina image this is just as uh, you know to show what all you can see from the poster pole to the periphery and it's definitely helpful for a learning person i would like to acknowledge my uh, team here and dr rohit who helped me he's my fellow in this presentation for the images and uh, definitely a wider perspective is always uh, helpful uh, thank you so much for this opportunity to aios and the uh, optos team thank you Thank you, Chatra. I think again that was an excellent presentation, sir. Dr. Dogra, sir, would you want to give some comments? Uh, well, uh, both uh, Chatra and Dr. Debulal, as well as Dr. Debashish, for introducing the subject. And uh, I think uh, it's a wonderful tool, and you have already seen. And what uh, Dr. Namrata was asking, the problem only happens because we don't have that great resolution. and that is where the problem usually is at this time if the resolution becomes better and if what you talked about 2d and 3d i think that's where a uh, little bit of a issue is there otherwise i think uh, we have uh, of course uh, i have not uh, now personally had the opportunity what chaitra also mentioned uh, of uh, experiencing now icg although when i was uh, the chief or the chairman of the department Uh, i uh, had only ordered for california so we wanted everything including icg so it it did come but uh, immediately after my retirement so my personal this thing uh, is uh, with the icg is not there but of course uh, other things few of them i'll be sharing from the older uh, optos machine um, uh, which we had and uh, of course uh, i am even try to uh, get one for this uh, Particular place where I work, Karewala Institute, because it's a very useful tool. Uh, so uh, there's no denial what uh, Dr. Uh, Devashi said in the beginning that you have so many uses. You can use it, uh, uh, and the opticians started using. So that is where <laughs> we are. So we have to be absolutely and showing everything to the patient. And these days there are so many patients, especially peripheral region. They say, "Could you show us?" and it is no way we can show we it is this is the only way we can show to the patient so that's very very important and that will be more and more demand for such things with your even what namrata you deal with refractive and other uh, problems i think they 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 want more uh, uh, documentation and they want to see what is going on so thank you very much for the <laughs> dr debashish sir we we'll sir as you are Can I can I say? Sorry, Rajesh. Yes. You were talking about refractive. It's used in refractive. I guess it will uh, make uh, life simpler for people to screen for uh, you know any lesion for patients who are coming to get refractive surgery done. So yeah, I mean uh, definitely uh, we screen all our uh, refractive patients, uh, cataract patients because refractive most of them are myopic, so we have to screen them. Yeah, yeah and uh, so you see the lesions and uh, obviously the retina people guide us that if you see a lesion where you are doing an intraocular or even refractive surgery uh, you need to treat those lesions i mean so uh, that's how it is done uh, so uh, yes i mean uh, ultra wide field imaging uh, i mean we are outsiders to the whole thing but i tell you i mean if we go into the depth of it the comprehensive ophthalmologists the cataract surgeons the retina surgeons uh, they love it they always want to have it yeah, yeah. but the fact is uh, how do we make it commercially viable so it needs the support of the comprehensive ophthalmologists so we have to support them and uh, as chaitra said that uh, yes people like to see their retina 
uh, and uh, of course a myopic uh, we could uh, do with indirect ophthalmoscopy but i i know that you know in a busy clinic probably a wide field uh, imaging would have been a uh, easier option and at the same time it could be a documentary thing which we can use in future for uh, you know for following it up so there are lot of advantages which we can put in one basket and see the thing going forward so that's it yeah. yes sir uh, actually published a similar thing uh, that is recently for the refractive special issue we actually pulled out some images and we compared clinically uh, you know lesions uh, and then we looked at the images and saw how many we have actually missed clinically but uh, we confirmed on imaging because you know whatever said and done when you are looking at the entire retina sometimes you miss a particular clock hour and you could have just missed a small hole there so all refractive patients uh, we pulled out their optos and checked you know and went back to our records and so i mean it was a little uh, shocking for the retina team but then you know there is a factor of human error which is uh, overridden by the objectivity of uh, imaging so we've uh, you know done a small study on that as well no so if you uh, this is if you see in uh, optos like uh, latest software there's a option called montage is available so sometimes in superior and inferior uh, images are not proper in that so if you go for a montage we can see even a superior and inferior images in that so some of my colleagues here in amdavad and some seniors they have made it mandatory so when they are going for this uh, lasik surgery before that patient comes here they are doing this montage of uh, uh, image for this patient we are just seeing the montage and we are sending the patient back so this is a kind of routine practice right now here in amdavad so and actually this will be the future because a patient doesn't have to go for dilatation same day patient can go for lasik workup also and same day they can do the lasik surgery so the thing of dilatation it's uh, almost gone so which patients who are coming from outside like rajasthan mp and all they want to go say on back same day so before they used to they never used to do uh, fundus imaging and all but right now it's possible due to this optos and specifically this montage feature where we need to see a routine picture uh, the central picture and diabetics and all that is a different but for myopic uh, patients this montage feature is uh, wonderful you know chaitra has made a very important statement and uh, I, i tell you <laughs> i'm an outsider to this uh, uh, wonderful meeting but uh, i mean uh, this a hurried examination uh, by a retina surgeon uh, she said can actually they can miss uh, findings uh, this is a very important thing so you know uh, this uh, amply <coughs> uh, supports that you know uh, white field imaging has a bigger advantage and uh, so i mean we have to see that you know <coughs> the amount of retina uh, people in the country are low how can we if the person has come to the institution and we have missed something this is not uh, uh, acceptable so we must consider it seriously and uh, this is the path forwards maybe yes part as you said so so could it be a dr devish yes yeah, I, i i want to just uh, uh, echo the point which has been raised by uh, dr devashish this happen often you see and it will happen more uh, now the younger generation are not interested uh, doing all this examination with 360 degree depression and all that you see the problem is it requires lot of efforts and then they, we know th there are lot of fallacies also you have lot of problems there might be uh, sometimes a iol sitting there cataract there or there are some other issues and uh, you may miss things and so it is not uncommon that we miss on examination and what we find on imaging so i think the future absolutely is here and that is the way we are going to be seeing patients in future there's no doubt i absolutely echo what uh, dr devashish has said do you think it is going to be a retinal assistant to us i mean without having a human face to it to the anterior segment surgeons exactly very true i can tell you uh, dr amrita what is going to happen is once you can get a image through a small pupil and the way 
uh, you get image and you can see that there's nothing grossly wrong. That is what the way it is going to be. And uh, I think it is more important also, I may tell you here, why it is becoming more important is, along with, of course, we are not talking, uh, or they have already incorporated OCT also, I think, in, in the, one of the models now, which is the recent one. Still so, I, I, yeah, so the, the way it is going, so it is going to be absolutely essential stool for any busy NTS segment surgeon who is doing cataract and refractive surgery, everything will be shown there. And even if he's using a high-end lenses, whether he is seeing the little ERM or some kind of other changes, he may not put that kind of a lens there because uh, there will be subsequent issues. So I think not only for refractive surgery, for periphery, but cataract surgery, everything, I think it will be a great tool. And this is the future. That is what is going to happen. Yes. Uh, I just have one query that uh, the, 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 it's for all the retina people that uh, when we do indirect in a case of cataract, uh, doing uh, in, uh, you know visibility with the indirect and visibility with optos, is there any difference? Uh, yes. Practice lens? Def definitely. Optos is having better resolution because Optos is using lasers. And what we are using is a simple light that gets scattered and we are getting less resolution. But Optos is having better uh, resolution in vitreous hemorrhage or uh, the scatracts and all, even corneal opacities. Exactly. What uh, uh, Dr. Rana is saying, uh, you can visualize through the small pupil. You can visualize through the uh, cataract. Of course, it, had, it need not be absolutely white, white there and with the vitreous hemorrhage and so many other things. So that is what the beauty is, that I think you can image retina now uh, just like that, which is, was almost impossible. And uh, we still have problem with indirect. We know that is a tool, of course, a great tool, but uh, uh, we may have problems uh, visualizing such a retina. I think we can move to the next talk, sir. Yes. Yes. So the next talk is going to be by Dr. Jacob. Dr. Jacob Chai. Okay. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Can you hear me? All right. Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, Okay, good. All right. Okay, thank you very much for this kind invitation. Firstly, I just want to acknowledge uh, the chairman, Dr. Debashi, uh, the moderators, Professor Rajesh, as well as uh, Professor Sharma. Thank you so much for putting all this together. Indeed, uh, after li listening to the first few uh, lectures and talk, I'm really humble when I among the midst of this uh, of your distinguished panel that uh, I've heard and of course uh, here. I also want to acknowledge uh, Nikon and Optus for the invitation. And of course, this uh, your all uh, India Osmology Society for putting all this together and congratulations on organizing this uh, successful talk in that sense. Um, my talk this uh, evening will be on a clinical experience of Optus. Definition of wide field, the earliest speaker has mentioned, of course, by default, Fundus camera provides a 30 to 50 degrees field of view. And to really enlarge this, we really have to change the traditional camera angle. And image angles larger than 50 degrees would be more or less be labeled as wide field. Definition of ultra wide field, earlier speaker has mentioned, it's not really been accurately defined. Some have defined it as more than 100, but some has defined it, gaining popularity defined in more than 150 degrees of view. This is a picture from the uh, ETDRS study where we can see the seven circles uh, indicating the seven subfield as well as the early Optos 100 with the uh, square with limitations of the retina field. But now with the Optos 200 degrees, we can have a wider field. And here the imaging capabilities of the Optus would be that of the 200 as the early speaker has mentioned, as well as incorporated in it will be the fluorescein, autofluorescence, as well as the ICG in the California system. We have also seen this uh, familiar picture. We can we know and understand that there are many signs of uh, retinal pathology which lurks in the periphery. These signs may, may, may go undetected as we have heard from earlier speakers using traditional exemption techniques. And again, long before the patient presents with any symptoms. With the ultra wide field, this allows for the guided treatment and provide additional diagnostic information to properly administer treatment. And again, earlier discussion, we have mentioned uh, it can also be imaged through an undilated 2.2 millimeter pupil. 
actually I want to retitle my talk rather than on just clinical experience, but rather seeing more than just ultra wide field. Again, we have seen, uh, we have heard from the experience from early speakers, their excellent presentation, that can see so much from the ultra wide field. What can we actually see more than ultra wide field? We are all familiar with the normal fundus photograph with the disc as well as the fovea macula. But essentially, this is a normal fundus photograph in the presence of a ultra-wide field. Studies have also shown even with the seven subfield ETDRS with a with ultra with a ultra-wide field, it can give up to three times more than that of a seven times ETDRS subfield. How so? In other words, a normal fundus photograph compared to ultra side field, ultra, uh, ultra wide field may be able to give up to 20 times more than that of a normal fundus photograph. Typically, this is a patient you can see represented with floaters. Again, a lot of surgical pathology can be imaged with a ultra wide field. In the superior nasal quadrant, you can see a retinal tear. And again, here highlighted within the red circle, the retinal tear, patient did not want to get a laser that day. One week later, patient was more cinematic with a bit of shadow. And you can see here that patient developed a little bit of limited retinal attachment as well as subretinal fluid. He undergone, he underwent a uh, uh, laser retinopexy, I can see by the laser scar. But however, a week later, he presented with more symptoms of a full of a retinal attachment that needs retinal attachment surgery. So this in that case would be both uh, instructive as well as in this day on age of medical legal prevalence, we need to document that we have actually counseled the patients with photographs, but however, patients would like to delay treatment and subsequently develop complications. It's also important to, to document with the opposite uh, eye, the, uh, uh, some lattice degeneration which predispose the patient to retinal detachment as the earlier speaker has also mentioned. Here you can see the lattice degeneration. Here again, documentation of the retinal tear, again uh, with uh, 360 degrees burn around the tear to secure the, that uh, the tear has been nicely secured with laser. Again, on the opposite eye to document the white without pressure that this patient has. It's not easy to document a, a peripheral retinal tear with just normal fundus photograph. Here we can see a very peripheral retinal tear which may not be easily picked up, but easily picked up on the optos ultra white field. Here highlighted within the red uh, circle and again, over here on a magnified view within the red circle will be very peripheral retinal tear. Later on, earlier speakers as was mentioned and later on I'll emphasize also some uses of the red and green laser or red and green channel. But here we can use the green channels to highlight the retinal pathology use, uh, with the green laser. So what else can we see beyond uh, that of ultra white field? Yes, we do see forest through the uh, trees, but sometimes you want to go back to a bit of, of details and not look at so much ultra wide field. What do I mean by that? This patient, we can see that it has a four quadrants of dot blood hemorrhages. You can see as well as some very peripheral ones, even in the temporal periphery, as well as some cotton wool spots on this ultra wide field two years ago. Patient, you can see when it focus on down onto the photograph, you can see that we don't lose much of the detail. So the resolution on a camera must not be just on a big picture, but also we must be able to capture a close in, close up photograph with the details. When patient came back again, of course, defaulted after two years, came back again, it seems that the retinal, retinopathy seemed to have resolved, but however, the sugar level did not uh, tell the same story. In fact, the sugar level has gone up. So how does the sugar level go up and the retinopathy seems to have resolved? Patient actually present, came back because she presented with a floater in the opposite eye. And here you can see that patient has some evidence of vitreous hemorrhage. When we look back at the photograph two years ago, again, patient has more florid retinopathy signs. You can see of the dot blood hemorrhages in the four quadrants as well as the cotton wool spots. So does it mean that the patient actually has better res has resolution of retinopathy despite sugar level being elevated? And patient came back because of cinematic vitreous attachment. Again, this is what she presented with. But we go back to the photograph done this time round, we can actually do miss on the nasal aspect, a front of new vessel, despite the almost resolution of the peripheral retinopathy lesion. Zooming in on the details of the, uh, 
of the posterior pole, we can actually see highlighted within the red arrows the details of the front of new vessel. Here, even with the magnified same view on the optus, which I did not do any uh, calibration to, we can see that the new vascularization, the new vascular front can be distinctly seen. And we go back to the photograph again, two years, magnified view. You can see again the, the florid dot blot, retinopathy signs, microaneurysm, and cotton wool spot. But however, the new vessels was actually absent. So it's important not just to have a big picture, but also do not lose the details. How about seeing beyond colors that the optos uh, gives? Again, earlier speaker has alluded to the color image with the red green separation. This is again, you can see the picture on the left hand side of the choroidal nevus, the green channels, which actually highlight the sensory retina to RPE and the red channels or the red laser for the RP or the deeper choroidal picture. So you can see that this choroidal nevus does not appear on the green channel, but on the red channel, which highlight the choroidal pathology. Ultra white field colors, again, putting in the ultra white field red laser where we accentuate the choroidal blood vessels, but the green laser will highlight and emphasize the retina and pre-retina pathology better. Again, this is a patient you can see with a pan retinal photocoagulation. Applying the green laser, we can see where the lasers are or areas of insufficient laser, for example, in the temporal quadrant. This patient also had laser done, but probably had some proliferative changes evidenced by the remnant of the vitreous hemorrhage. Here you can see application of the red laser will highlight the retinal vessels as well as the hemorrhage better. But again, without losing detail, zooming in on the same picture, color funnels photograph, applying the green channels of green laser, we want to highlight the areas of new vessels that may be missed using the color funnels photograph. Again, this patient, diabetic retinopathy, multiple, uh, lots of pan retinal uh, laser have been done. Again, we want to apply the green laser or the green, uh, green channel to highlight the retinal sclerosis vessels as well as the pre-retinal fibrotic membranes that in this patient. So again, on the opposite eye, the pre-retinal membranes have been highlighted on the green channels or the green laser, but also in an institution where we also want to show the residents the areas of insufficient or deficient laser that can be applied or topped up with this patient using the green channels. Again, post top up laser, you can again apply the green channels or green laser to show them that again, it has been nicely topped up. How about seeing beyond the still photograph? What is seeing beyond the still? This is another patient again with a pan retinal photocoagulation done. Again, probably proliferative in nature, evidenced by the pre retinal and vitreous remnant hemorrhage. The green channels, green laser will highlight the retinal pathology well, but sometimes applying the 3D function on this, uh, on the California, you can actually see the areas that is deficient or has been adequately or inadequately lasered in a sense with the three dimension picture. How about seeing beyond the patient's request or the complaint? And what does it mean? These patients came in requesting for, for LASIK, refractive surgery. What do we see in the periphery? Not much pathology, but again, without losing details, we go zoom in and on the center of focus around the disc, we can actually see areas of cotton wool spots in this young lady who requests for refractive surgery. In the presence of flame hemorrhages, multiple cotton wool spots, not forgetting blood disc margin and uh, disc swelling as well as sclerosis vessel, this has a patient has a hypertensive retinopathy, which can be diagnosed even on the white field without losing the details. And of course, on the opposite eye, again, we do see the cotton wool spots as well as some uh, sclerosis vessels. This diagnosis is obvious. Patient presented symptomatically with blurring of vision, found to have branch retinal vein occlusion on the superior temporal aspect of the left eye, successful la successfully lasered, as you can see here. So this is a close-up view of the successful laser on the sectoral laser for this branch retinal vein occlusion, green channel showing the sclerosis vessels as well as the extent of the laser, both surrounding the sclerosis vessel as well as to the far periphery. But looking beyond the patient complaint of the left eye, we image the right side as well routinely. Here, what do we see? Almost looking normal, almost normal looking retina, but you might just spot a sclerosis vessels inferiorly. So zooming in, you can see there's a sclerosis vessels inferior to this. 
in this asymmetric right eye, you can also be able to see the darkening supplied by this retinal vessel. This wedge-shaped distribution, again, will be manifested, enhanced and highlighted on the green channels, as you can see here, where it highlights the retinal pathology better. Again, another patient with untreated branch retinal vein occlusion with the green laser follow-up, again, we can see the resolution of the hemorrhages as well as the extent of the laser and again, enhanced accentuated with the green laser. How about seeing beyond the obvious? How can ultra wide field help us see beyond the obvious? Here we can see uh, patients with lots of uh, vitreal, vitreal opacity, this uh, reflective, uh, reflective crystals rather, uh, looks like synchysis scintillans to me. And uh, again, do we miss anything in the posterior pole? Just like this synchysis scintillans, a degenerative uh, condition of the vitreous, here we also can have a degenerative condition on the retina or over the macula. It looks also reflective in nature. Again, you can see at the red arrows, these are actually reflective drusen. Here on the close-up view, without losing details, you can see they also, sorry, uh, sorry, you can see that uh, also green, uh, sorry, also uh, yellowish reflective in nature, like the synchysis synthesis of cholesterol crystals. It may look like on a white field, just like those crystals, but it's actually on the macula. Again, this will be confirmed on the autofluorescence looking at the red arrows. So this brings me to the next point of seeing black and white. This is a patient, again, where it looks like what looks like source be like, a pseudo-inflammatory kind of macular dystrophy, where we do see all these white and yellow deposits or spots on the retina, which are obviously not drusen. They are also associated with this form and atrophic kind of a macular degeneration. Again, there's, we do know in, in source B, there's atrophy of the retina, RPE, retinal pigment, as well as the choroid slowly marching, progressing towards the periphery. Here, enhanced with the red channels or red laser, we are able to see the retinal atrophy and, sorry, uh, there are green channels, sorry, with the enhanced the, the, red, the retinal pathology, but with the red channel, we enhance the choroidal pathology here, showing the red choroidal atrophy. And what is uh, instructive and here would be that application of the autofluorescence where we show the atrophy of the retinal pigment epithelium, which is not actually seen on just, just on the color fundus photograph. And of course, on the, on the patient's opposite eye, which also has the white and yellow spots, the disciform atrophy over the posterior pole. Here we do see some uh, hemorrhages, retinal hemorrhages, which is also typical in source B pseudo-inflammatory macular degeneration. However, enhanced with the green channels, the hemorrhages, retinal hemorrhages is more uh, obvious and highlighted, which we do not see again on the color fundus photograph. Here is a follow-up after patients has the retinal hemorrhages re re uh, resolved. You can see a nice broad white, ultra wide field picture of the patient's posterior pole with resolution of the retinal hemorrhages. Again, what is really useful here with the application of a autofluorescein to show that the posterior pole has undergone atrophy of the RP or retinal pigment epithelium combined with the atrophy of the retina and choroid patient presented with poor vision in both eyes. And here is a close-up view of the patient pathology. And, uh, and this is a patient self, which you can't see on the fundus photograph. How about in retinal dystrophy? You can see that there's quite a lot of peripheral coral retinal atrophy here using the uh, uh, green channels. Again, the retinal pathology is highlighted. And you can see over here that if despite the, the areas, the large areas of coral retinal atrophy on, the, on, this, on this red channel, you can also see the choroidal vessels being thinned out and being atrophic on this, in this patient's right eye. This patient, similarly on the opposite eye, on the left eye, very stormy, very, uh, very uh, ugly looking kind of retina because there's lots of pathology in the periphery. But you can see that the coral retinal atrophy is mainly limited to the nasal superior and inferior to this sparing the posture. As compared to this next patient, next patient also retinal dystrophy looks like retinitis pigmentosa with bony speckles pigmentation in the mid periphery, but not as much as the earlier patient. By using the green channels, you can see retinal uh, atrophy, but on the red 
channels, you can see that the choroidal atrophy actually involves the possible, even though the color and the retina did not show up very well. And again, on the opposite eye, not as much core retinal atrophy, not as much uh, pony speaker pigmentation as the earlier patient, but because of the choroidal pathology and atrophy, this patient actually presents with worse vision compared to the earlier patient. So here, a close-up view with the color fundus photograph, as well as the green channels and the red channels looking at the uh, attenuation and thinning of the choroidal vessels. How about looking at some routine cases? Here, uh, one of the critics and skeptics about optics, I would say, is not so much, as we have heard, it's not so much the ultra wide field uh, capabilities, but really looking at medical pathology. Again, I've tried to move away from my earlier uh, surgical pathology, but to showcase more medical retinal pathology, which, I, which is actually my interest. In this patient, you can see a bit of opacification or graying of the posterior pole with a powerful view gray sheen in combination with the RP pigmentation and crystalline deposit, this will go for a diagnosis of PFT. Again, may not show very well on this uh, channel, but with the green channel, we know that this is a retinal pathology and the crystals usually be highlighted here in a PFT. This patient, this young girl presented with photopsia and blurring of vision, you can see all these uh, dots, whitish, yellowish dots in the posterior pole, as well as a periphery. Patient probably has a mutes or multiple white dots uh, syndrome. And using, we know that this is not a corridor pathology. Using the red channel will not be able to show any pathology, but with the green channels highlighting the retinal pathology or highlight the retinal location, you can see the, right, the white dots are actually accentuated. Follow up color fundus photograph shows disappearing and uh, resolution of the white dot. Choroidal uh, red channels is normal. And again, with the green channels, so resolution of those white dots. Again, another routine case would be that of pathological myopia. We see a lot in Singapore. Tessellated uh, uh, fundus appearance, RP atrophy, peripapal atrophy, as well as tilted disc. Paving stone doc, uh, degeneration in the peripheral documented on one ultra wide field, and as well as vascular straightening. Choroidal thinning on the red channels, as well as the bearing of the sclera on the, as well as the thin uh, vessels and retinal atrophy on the green channels. Again, on the opposite eye, typical pathological myopic fundus of peripheral changes and macular changes, as well as the, these changes, choroidal atrophy and retinal atrophy. How about CSR? CSR, we do see quite a number, nothing much in the periphery. But again, on the, red, uh, on the green channels, you do not see retinal uh, pathology. But again, on the, just on the red channels where you highlight the corridor, we can see there's probably a bit of hypervascularity of the corridor blood vessels. But however, instructive and would be, would be that of an autofluorescence where you can see the hyperfluorescence on the AF. This can be confirmed on a white field uh, fluorescent uh, angiogram, which I'll talk about after this, you can see the ink blots kind of leakage on the right eye. And again, routinely will be that of screening the left eye where this patient has a double pathology. So these are some of the routine cases. How about seeing beyond the routine? Again, earlier speaker has also mentioned in a patient with RP or retinoid pigmentosa has probably has weak zonules. And here we can see image the periphery of a dislocated uh, uh, lens here, again, with a picture of the RP picture and a dislocated lens in one picture. How about seeing the flow finally? We do know that it's tedious and it's laborious, uh, laborious for the technician to really image the peripheral capillary retina, especially in retinal vein occlusion, to really capture not just the central macular uh, edema or ischemia, but also the peripheral fallout and peripheral ischemia. Here, you can see symptomatic left eye of this patient, but uh, on the right eye, you can see it's normal, again, with the branch retinal vein occlusion, a magnified view of the branch retinal vein occlusion. Here, on the fluorescein angiogram in the early frames, you can see the delayed venous return, as well as ischemia, as well as the capillary drops out in the later frames, capillary insufficient in the late frames. Here, zooming in of the macula, we can see the macular ischemia of this patient presented with poor vision. Good uh, ultra view, uh, ultra wide view photograph uh, to, to document the slow resolution of the hemorrhages with the application of the sectoral laser and again helped by the green laser. 
interestingly, this patient opposite eye routinely with, a, with the help of ultrawide field, looking like a normal uh, fluorescein angiogram on the opposite eye, but you see these light bulbs on the superior part, which you probably miss. I will probably, I miss them, just clinical examination. And this swings the diagnosis, needing further investigation of this patient's right eye. How about in arterial occlusion? Here, a normal fundus photograph, you can see whitening, uh, swelling, edema of the superior retina. Again, with the ultra white view, you can see the superior, almost hemi-feel of the left eye is actually involved. Again, this is a fluorescein angiogram, starting with the first picture on the top right, superior hemifield delay retina, arm retinal time. Magnified view of this, you can see the delay, but you can see also that the, the macular of fovea is not really involved, fairly well perfumed. Patient actually has pretty good vision, except for a bit of patchy inferior field defects. Again, with the ultra white, with the ultra white field, you can see the pale edema swelling retina on this color fundus photograph. Another routine or beyond routine cases, this will be a CSR evidenced by the uh, pigmented tracks on temporal to the fovea. Not much on the green uh, field, but here on the, uh, on the choroidal or the, or the red channel, you can see the dilated vessels. And again, very important will be the autofluorescein applied here. Again, confirm on the fluorescein, the staining of the tract and the ink blots and the dilated choroidal vessels on the ICG. Again, patient has a double pathology, nicely documented on the ultra wide field, dilated ICG corridor vessels you can see here. Last but not least, I just want to have uh, some examples of vitreous hemorrhage. Typical example of patient with dense vitreous hemorrhage, surgery to evacuate the vitreous hemorrhage. This patient has PCV, very common over this part of the world, polypoidal, uh, corridor, polypoidal corridor vasculopathy, evidenced by the huge peripheral subretina as well uh, as well as retinal hemorrhage and periphery. So here we can document the, the slow resolution of the uh, of the hemorrhages and we can more or less confirm in the fluorescein angiogram part. However, we do know that PCP is an ICG diagnosis. However, this patient was allergic to ICG, I could only document some leakages on the periphery with the fluorescein angiogram. This last patient is probably more typical in your part of the world. Patient presented with vitreous hemorrhage. You can see some lasers applied to periphery and some, some remnant vitreous hemorrhage. Here, with extensive vascular involvement, peripheral ischemia, new vessels, this will go for diagnosis of EUC disease confirmed on the fluorescein angiogram. And just to document with the ultra wide field, document the, uh, the pre retinal hemorrhage or the, from the new vessels at the superior nasal areas as well as extensive nasal laser that has been applied. So seeing more than ultra wide field, we do want to go back to the details. We look beyond the still and photos. We want to look beyond the obvious, beyond the routine, as well as we do have black and white with the red green channels as well as autofluorescein, as well as a fluorescein angiogram and ICG to make it a compact kind of multimodal imaging on the Optus white field system. On behalf of my team, I just want to thank you very much for your attention and a kind invitation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Jacob. Uh, it was a very elaborate bouquet of cases and very well explained to all of us. Uh, my disclosure that I am not a retina person. So uh, it was really very useful and I will find that the uh, entire uh, audience uh, listening to the meeting would have uh, the same opinion. Now I would request uh, uh, none other than Professor Manga Dogra to tell us about uh, ultra wide field imaging in posterior uveitis. Dr. Professor Manga, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Devashish. Uh, and thank you, AIOS, as well as uh, uh, the Optos group for giving me this opportunity to be here today. Uh, in a very uh, sort of a light group uh, talking about a modality which in fact uh, has really revolutionized uh, uh, I think the retinal uh, uh, imaging and uh, I I'm going to uh, talk to you a little bit about uh, ultra field uh, 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 wide field imaging in uveitis uh, although I'll be just showing you some of the cases and uh, 
basically i think all these things have been talked i'm not talking about these things they have been very nicely dealt with and so is about uh, uh, what we have this non contact and and the fields everything has been very nicely dealt and so uh, i think uh, here uh, i'm just talking something which has been published from our group uh, uh, this is the ultra wide field uh, uh, in uh, paradoxic worsening in tb uvitis uh, you see uh, in this study what we had found that we could see additional lesions uh, significant additional lesion then on conventional uh, uh, imaging in paradoxical uh, worsening which happens after multifocal serpiginous choroiditis once you put them on it anti tubercular treatment that's how these days in fact uh, it is from our group the whole work has come especially uh, it was uh, professor amod gupta's uh, guidance and, uh, and then subsequently dr vishali gupta and uh, they have now devised a way that these patient need to be put on immunosuppression before the att is started that's otherwise they can worsen very fast and so the management also was altered you see almost in 38% of the cases in these only thing is uh, i can't show you the images here somehow because since i am retired now somehow i had a images somewhere but i could not get them as far as uh, this paradoxical worsening is concerned but i'll be showing you uh, other images which were with me especially for the uh, retinal vasculitis i think uh, uh, ultra file field imaging uh, uh, and especially the fundus fluorescein angiography in vasculitis which is going to tell us both about uh, the vasculitis part which will show a peripheral leakage and cnp areas as well as new vascularization and so many other things which are seen so i'll be sharing some details regarding some cases uh, regarding uh, this this is one picture you see you can see uh, i don't think you can get a picture like this otherwise if you don't have a uh, um, optos machine now what you see here is i'll show you subsequently the cases here of a disease which is more and more we are diagnosing this is irwan uh, and uh, these cases are very frequent and you can see new vascularization of the disc here and extensive these uh, peripheral non perfusion all around 360 degree as well as of course there are other features of vasculitis you can see those little leakage around the vessels so all these features can be very nicely picked up in with the fundus fluorescein angiography which has been performed with the optos so uh, i'm we had published in fact uh, we have published almost like four papers on this particular entity from our center and uh, i'll show you some of the cases out of that the one case which i am sharing here is a 34 year old male and you can see here what is happening is that you are seeing these vessels here and these vessels are occluded some laser scars over here you can see as well as you can see the, the, these are all sclerosed vessels and this featureless retina totally as if it is not having anything so we expect it to be ischemic and uh, the best part is look at this angiogram wild ultra wild field angiogram and that is what you see here this part is not perfusing so are the other area you can see some laser is performed here but what you see here is more much more clearer in the next frame and you can see now the new vascularization of the disc and extensive area of capillary non perfusion and all around here also you can see how much area is there which is non perfused and you see these knotted kind of uh, you see vessels which were seen better here you can see these knots are very typical they are along the arterioles this is the hallmark of diagnosis of irwan so these knots arterial knots which are seen along the arterioles they will be seen so that is what happens in them and so subsequently you can see almost the diffuse kind of a leakage happening here and this particular case was finely laser and you can see here how much laser was required and you can document everything as well as you can monitor i am not going into the whole uh, follow up of this case
but you can monitor and you can even retreat if there are certain areas which require treatment. So that is what is the, the importance of uh, doing a, 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 this kind of imaging as well as angiography in these cases. I'll share you another case of Irwan with you, 14-year-old uh, girl. Uh, she came with just hand movements vision in both eyes. And uh, conventional imaging shows something like this here in both the eyes. You can see extensive problems. But what was uh, that we diagnosed this as, again, Irwan. So she received intravitreal bevacizumab followed by parsimonia vitrectomy and endolaser photocoagulation in both eyes. And that is the way these are just with your normal conventional camera. But I just wanted to share with you Here, just look at this picture. Now, this is the right eye. Now, you can see uh, after parsimonia vitrectomy, extensive laser has been done. And you can demonstrate that. You can demonstrate the exudation here, as well as you can demonstrate these closed vessels. But what is very important here is look at this angiogram. Can you imagine seeing anything like this? You can absolutely imagine image everything and the extensive area still seen here where you may put some more laser. Even what was surprising is how this uh, girl is seeing 20, 30, 6, 9 and uh, there is some macular ischemia here. Despite this, she's seeing that kind of vision. Uh, so I think this kind of a documentation is not possible without uh, this kind of ultraviolet field imaging. And this is the other eye, same way, where past plan planar vitrectomy was done. You can see extensive laser done, sclerosed vessels. And look at the angiogram. And here the vision was poor, just about 6 by 60, 20 by 200 here. And uh, somehow, I don't know what was the reason that that eye was seeing better. But you can see here how the whole retina was knocked off and has been lasered. And that's how you could control such a aggressive disease. Despite that, you can still see here some new of the disc. So I think in vasculitis of any kind, I have not shown you the conventional vasculitis. There are so many as well as a nice example shown by Dr. Chang of eel disease, which uh, in fact, these days hardly we diagnose mostly. There is a cause for that. Maybe these cases are tubercular or other sarcoid, that is what happens in, in them. And I would like to uh, again show you a very interesting case, 66 years old male presented with count finger vision in both eyes. The interior segment was normal and the clinical diagnosis only was uh, suggestive of a bilateral vitreolateral lymphoma with multiple branch retinal inclusion in the right eye. So this patient, because we wanted to confirm the diagnosis, underwent parsimonia vitrectomy with subretinal biopsy, which did confirm B cell lymphoma and was treated subsequently with the intravitreal methotrexate 0.4 milligram in 0.1 ml. I'll be showing you all that. This is the way the patient presented. You can see here what is happening here is you have upper temporal and nasal. Uh, occluded vessels, that is what the multiple branch vein occlusions are there. And you can see other features here, multiple yellowish exudates <laughs> inferiorly. And uh, look at the other eye. So this is what, uh, in fact, uh, was so suggestive of the diagnosis that we were almost sure that we are here dealing with. So you had these kind of uh, uh, yellowish uh, elevated subretinal lesions. And... Uh, on observation, they can be seen that they can change in shape. They can sort of, uh, so that is what uh, uh, you see clicks the diagnosis clinically, but you need to confirm it. Now, also, I am sharing with you here the images of the autofluorescence in this particular patient. And uh, so you can see the different features, how they look like, where you have these deposits. And the other areas where you have almost like a leopard skin appearance, which is so important to, uh, to demonstrate. And uh, of course, uh, then in, in, look at the angiograms here and uh, you can see these vessels. Uh, of course, you have uh, 
leopard skin here as well as you have uh, these uh, vessels uh, which are uh, over those areas which are uh, sort of leaky so they are over those areas where you have subretinal deposits and of course uh, this is the autofluorescence uh, uh, sorry uh, over here and once the uh, plasma vitrectomy with subretinal biopsy was done you can even demonstrate through the gas you see a very good image of the area in the periphery from there where the biopsy was taken so you can you see very nicely document everything what has been done and even uh, uh, you can be sure and even show to the patient sometimes of course i am not going into detail here that's not the that this was confirmed as a b cell lymphoma and ultimately uh, methotrexate first twice weekly then once weekly then once a month uh, total 25 injections were given per uh, you can see here a lot of injections were given and you can see here how the whole thing changed uh, after injection this is the right eye and uh, the much more was the left eye you can see what happens from count finger it became 636 and you can see with methotrexate all those uh, uh, lesions uh, or the deposits they have disappeared so uh, i'll go to another case which is a 45 year old male with sudden progressive vision loss in both eyes it was diagnosed to be hiv 15 days back only and was started on the art and the cd4 count was 91 cells and this initially presented to some private practitioner outside and was referred to a hospital and uh, you can see here uh, the vision is count finger close to face in hand movements so almost like patient is not seeing anything but there is a lot of inflammation ciliary congestion is there there are three plus cells in the anterior segment flare you can see in both the eyes but there were no synechi and the pupils were already hydrogenically dilated from outside and uh, you can see the way the photogram was seen this is the right eye so or you can see these lesions all are here going all the way to the periphery and you can see these subretinal lesions and you can't make out what it is and it, they are bilateral this is the other eye now these are like tiny different size deposits there which are seen so what are we dealing here is it a endogenous endophthalmitis uh even syphilitic or of course may not be on a typical toxoplasmosis could be and uh, so looking at all this uh, toxo as well as serum hsv and uh, uh, but what was important here this turned out to be syphilitic you can see tpha was positive so was uh, here vdrl and was started on uh, intravenous uh, cefaxon 1.2 mg twice a day for 14 days after neurology consultation and uh, so you can see what happens that uh, this patient uh, now this is the uh, uh, day five uh, after uh, the uh, vitrectomy was done for the uh, because of the confusion in the diagnosis and then you can see uh, this is what the legion have started disappearing and then this is day seven and subsequently you can see the legions they he started seeing uh, better but i'm not showing the whole story the idea is that you can imagine as well as monitor the therapy and also uh, demonstrate it to the patient as well as subsequently if the new lesions are appearing you will be able to see them very well here so uh, we also have uh, published uh, another uh, uh, paper this is the ultraviolet wild field fundus autofluorescence uh, in management of cmv retinitis so in this particular study, ultra wide field fundus autofluorescence showed better delineation of borders of lesion in 29% and larger area of involvement in almost 33% and picked up uh, the, in seven of the nine, 70, the recurrence was picked up uh, and so were the cotton wool, which were not seen otherwise that well. So this is also published uh, recently, in fact, in 2020 in, uh, again, Ocular Immunology and, uh, and uh, Inflammation Journal. And I am showing you one uh, picture out of that only. If you look at it here, the right on the top and the red arrow here, 
this is the fundus photo. And if you do a at order fluorescence, you can see this border here. And this border is appearing hyper order fluorescence. So hyper in, I have not shown you a lot of images, means that something is going on here if it is seen hyper. Otherwise, you see the area which is hypo. And, and that's what happens. That very area becomes more hyper and active activity appears here. And so the clinically, the, two weeks later only, we could see the active uh, and fluffy lesions and which required management. So uh, I can go and show you some more cases, but I thought these pick up uh, most of the uh, important features. Of course, I have not shown you so many others which, which are uh, again, uh, uh, especially about the tubercle uveitis, I couldn't get a hold of those images here. So in conclusion, ultra wild field imaging improves the diagnosis and management of patient with retinal pathology involving the mid and far peripheral uh, of retina. So that is what examples I have shown you. And ultra wild field fluorescein angiography, I've shown you a lot of images. Some of them just spectral, uh, very, very uh, impressive images. And ICG angiography, in fact, I told you that we uh, earlier that we have got uh, uh, for PGI now the California, they started doing already ICG. So I don't have that, uh, those images with me. I showed you some of the autofluorescence images, which appear to provide several benefits for inflammatory disorders. I think I'll just uh, suggest to you to go through this particular uh, issue of the journal. And this is the editorial written by uh, Amit Keningham Monk. And, you know, he's the man who has done maximum work uh, case here as far as the ultra wide field uh, uh, or uh, the work on Optos is concerned. And Manfred, who is the editor of this particular journal, this is the editorial. So you have several articles on ultra, as far as the ultra wild field imaging in uveitis is concerned in this particular uh, issue, which is uh, published in 2019 in ocular immunology and inflammation. So thank you friends uh, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, uh, Professor Dogra. It was a eye opener and as is expected from a professor, we really had an total uh, insight into the posterior uveitis and ultra uh, wide field imaging. Of course, your last recommendation definitely stands tall. We should be reading <coughs> this article. I would strongly recommend Dev Dulal and all of us to go through it. Uh, but in the core, I always felt uh, that you are missing your ultra wide field imaging. Well, it yes. will come definitely <laughs> and you will it in the near future. And over to you, Dr. Partho, Dr. Partho Rana and his uh, Netralia, the super specialty eye hospital in Ahmedabad. So uh, we have another 10 minutes to go, but Partho, uh, take your time, but uh, we should not overshoot the time also. Thank you very much. And let's go over to Partho. I hope my slides are visible. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. They were the watches, sir. I will try not to overshoot it. I'll try to thank AIOS and Optus people first to giving me this opportunity. I'm going to uh, present today use of ultra wide field imaging uh, for patient education. I am Dr. Pathrana from Ahmedabad. So first, my, some, some of my disclosures. I have no financial interest whatsoever. My presentation is basically on practical challenges, what we are facing in day-to-day -day, uh, challenges. And basically, Optos can do so many things. Like all of our dignitary presenters, they have already told, our, told us about it. So we can uh, see retina. We can even see choroid. We can see blood vessels clearly. We can see through... Uh, hemorrhage and cataract, we can see even through silicon oil or gas. So this Optos uh, Daytona, what we are using here, is an uh, exceptional instrument. Uh, in future, they are going to incorporate OCTs. Uh, already they have incorporated OCT in that, which is going to come in India in, I think, few months or a year. 
so that also it, yeah, it will be able to do so right now if we see like only one thing uh, we are not able to do with optos like we can't see beyond the eye so that's what i will like to say about it so this optos is uh, doing wonderful uh, we are using it from last february 7th uh, february 7th 2020 and today is the 6th february so just in a year we have already scanned more than 6200 cases and more than 20000 uh, 20, images we have right now in our optos so this thing is wonderful like we can do so many things with it but we are able to do it we are diagnose we are able to diagnose uh, so many of the things but what is the benefit with patient like how can we counsel a patient with that we are able to diagnose it we are able to see the pathology but what is benefit to the patient so my presentation is little bit on light side i i hope i won't uh, hurt anyone sentiment i'm just going to show like how we are going to uh, sell it to the patient so in india we have three kinds of patients first is like in i we can, we only have one thing uh, that is cataract we call it like cataract or maniac patients so uh, all of the uh, people who are like listening to me like a general ophthalmologist or a retina surgeon all of them we are facing this like day and night like we have only cataract in eye we can't have anything in retina or cornea or anything else second type of patients they are google trained so they are literated by the google and third kind of patient which is obedient like really if i'll tell you this species is very rare so the scatterchromania patient when they come to us it's like i am the smartest man alive and i know everything so many of the time when we try to explain them what is there in uh, retina they always have some excuses like this there's only one problem in eye which can be only cataract so when we hear like as a retina surgeon when we hear this thing it's kind of very irritating then uh, any diminution of vision can be due to only one thing that is cataract i'm not writing that word because like so many of the time we get kind of irritated with uh, this word like why always cataract that there's a retina called thing in your eye so once the cataract surgery is done i become kind of bulletproof no surgery no medicine is needed once cataract surgery is done it's totally bulletproof so when patient comes to me after cataract surgery after a year or after five years the first thing patient tells to me is like my surgery is done already so why this is happening so i have to explain there's another part in your eye so so many times like when we are explaining like i have even heard i don't have retina <laughs> so you need a evidence so this optos is giving us this evidence so when patient comes to me when i show him this uh, 3d wrap thing which is already inbuilt in the uh, optos so we can just show them so this is your uh, retinal imaging and as you can see this part is inside your eye it is on back side of your eye when we explain this then patient have like little bit of faith on a retina surgeon otherwise they always feel like i have done my cataract surgery why something is happening in my eye so there is a second type of patient that is a google trade like mainly this kind of patients are from uh, from urban this cataractomania patients are from rural uh, setup but this patients are from urban setup when we are sitting here like we are seeing uh, this kind of patient day to day and this uh, species is increasing like they always google it and then come to us so they have lot of questions lot of doubts are there they always come uh, to doctor for examination not for their own examination to have a exam of doctor's knowledge in his own specialization field which he took to gears to excel so usually they come and try to correlate with the google uh, uh, literature what they found and what doctor is saying if that is correct or not so to satisfy them also we need some evidence so when we are showing them like this is my today's patient only a young girl 24 years old in right eye as you can see there is a rd with pvr and so many of subretinal membranes and uh, in left eye also patient is having retinal detachment with membrane luckily in left eye this uh, macula is on so she was able to see she went to uh, optician for like around 8 to 10 times and they prescribed her glasses and she was able to see suddenly once she went to a ophthalmo general ophthalmologist he told this uh, retinal detachment and she couldn't believe it the the uh, general ophthalmologist sent the patient to me and i saw the patient i explained her i showed her the retinal photo then she had like something in mind like okay i can have a retina and it can also detach so 
there's one more patient like patient uh, came to me with a retinal hole when we explained a uh, patient was not able to understand how a hole can happen in a retina so we showed the patient like this is your retinal hole and when we lasered so we showed the evidence also that i have already lasered your retina so we always need uh, evidence so here we can show the patient like patient is having a retinal hole the one patient like when uh, we saw the patient patient had crvo and we asked uh, we did uh, ffa and then we uh, asked patient to undergo the laser so once the laser was done patient asked us like how laser was done and what what all areas you have lasered we can show it here like how the laser was done there's a one more kind of patient it just like totally obedient when we ask the patient patient is really ready on the same the same day same time like uh, this species is like really uh, rare but uh, <laughs> this kind of patient tries to understand what doctor says and try to obey but uh, so many of the times uh, like what happens is retina surgeries are not re rewarding like cataracts so so many of the time when patient is not having six x vision the relatives comes and they ask for a second opinion or they ask for evidence like what has happened and why you you have not got any good vision because when they hear about cataract on second day or third day patient is having like six x vision so why for this surgery you have spent this much and you still don't have that good vision so to maintain patient trust we need some good evidence in our hand like what has happened and what we did so this is one of my patient uh, it a uh, patient was having giant retinal tear so before surgery i showed the patient like your retina is like totally fallen like this it has uh, tore apart and on the next day of the surgery as you can see here this uh, this picture is just from the next day of the surgery as you can see uh, from silicon oil from so much of uh, corneal edema i was able to take the picture and i was able to show the show it that your retina is on so right now you are able to see you are not able to see totally your vision is little bit less but your retina is on so my part is almost done so so many of the cases we are able to help the patient like that there is one more case like giant retinal tear and patient was not able to understand like how can it happen and i just showed the patient this this is the thing and it has fallen like this so when patient saw the picture patient was able to imagine like how it has happened and patient understood and patient went for surgery patient was already a fake we operated the patient on next day patient was able to see and we showed like your red eye is totally on and patient was kind of happy so even like this kind of case is like for retina it's not just for uh, medical purposes we show we have already seen so many of the medical cases where like so many of the thing happens but for surgical things like so many of the holes or like uh, this giant retinal tear or this retinal detachments we can even plan surgery with this we can explain the patient like what has happened and even after surgery what i did i can even show like this is like 360 degree laser barrage i have done for you this hole which was there i have done a cryo there even your retina is totally on you are able to see in center your peripheral vision uh, might be little bit less i can explain everything with through this and patient is able to correlate the things when patient is able to correlate the things then patient will have the uh, continuous trust on doctor because right now this uh, whatever things are happening outside or whatsapp or whatever thing we can tell patient's trust on doctor is little bit less but this is the thing where we can gain the trust of patient we can explain the patient we can even i take the patient where we want like patient's understanding is very less of especially for retina so we can take the patient at least uh, to a level where patient can understand what we are doing and patient can have trust on us so this is one more case patient had a uh, huge uh, hemorrhage and patient was not able to see i explained the patient you will be able to see from like a little bit sides and patient understood like okay this is the same kind of thing even i asked the patient you are able to see something like uh, uh, hair balls in your eye and patient was able to correlate when we operated the patient patient vision was around 624 so i can even explain the patient as you can see like i have done whatever lasers i can and like retina is totally on slowly slowly you are going to get the uh, result but before uh, the result was uh, before the picture was like this but right now we are able to see your retina so patient also gained the trust with that i'll show one more case like this was the pre op hemorrhage and we operated the case and patient had the uh, picture like this so this is one more case i like to show like the, this patient came to us just few days ago only like when we did, did our optos i can see just faint disc here 
like uh, in my indirect ophthalmoscopy, I was not able to see anything in the fundus, but we saw a faint disc here. Then we operated the case. When we operated the case, uh, we saw a large uh, cyst in the retina, and uh, there were uh, there was a sclerosis vessel here. So I explained the patient like we found this below your retina. In B scan, we already showed the patient like something like this is already there. But when patient saw like when the hemorrhage was removed and patient saw like uh, this cyst is like this and something was wrong. there then patient understood patient correlated with that i explained the patient like you are able to see around 75% of your visual fields and 25% of the area like you are having uh, something like this so patient was able to correlate and patient was able to understand patient uh, went already to uh, multiple doctors before but patient uh, was not able to uh, was not satisfied properly but once i showed the patient this image is patient was satisfied with that so this is uh, these are the last images what we uh, took and we showed the patient and still the patient is continuing with me just due to one thing because patient is able to correlate what i am showing to the patient patient is able to correlate the things with that so the reasons why patient don't trust doctors right now due to some popular tv shows uh, with some actors national award winning actors some popular movies also and some of our colleagues with uh, negative marketing also so like, there are a lot of things happening in the market but if you want to gain the trust of your patient you have to go to a space where patient don't let everyone uh, go there and if you want to reach there you need uh, some confidence you need to have some correlation with the patient so this getting this correlation you need a proper image you can even get it with the simple fundus camera also but a simple fundus camera is giving you a central picture when peripheral things are there like as i showed this in periphery when uh, this holes are there and if i have lasered this hole so i can't show it in uh, this uh, simple uh, fundus camera so optos is the only technology which is able to do it and right now like it is the need of the r so in future it is the thing so right now as we can see like uh, its prices are quite high not everyone is able to afford it but in future i think even optometrists are going to have it i am not uh, talking about like uh, ophthalmic uh, surgeons even optometrists are going to have it because this is the future i mean undilated picture if you are able to see till this periphery this is the future as i told before like so many of the cases like uh, when people were avoiding like uh, uh, our colleagues were avoiding to do uh, fundoscopy when they want to do the lasik on the same day now they are sending the patients cuz they know we don't have to dilate to see the periphery so this is changing some habits this is uh, this is changing habits not only of retina surgeons of general ophthalmologists also and it's going to change the practice pattern like uh, right now when patient comes to me this all of the patients they have already done optos and they are, then they are coming to me so so many of the time when i am missing a few things in uh, indirect ophthalmoscopy as namrata madam told before like uh, uh, when we are seeing fundus if we have missed one clock hour and if we have missed one hole and we have written like this is a normal fundus and you go ahead for your lasik surgery this is a kind of legal document we are providing to the patient so patient can sue us on uh, on that but when we are showing a fundus photo like it is totally clear uh, clear image and then we are writing it then it's kind of hard hardcore evidence we are giving with that so at the time of presentation patient didn't have anything and spe specifically the, for this montage thing so this montage thing what periphery it is able to cover in undilated it's not possible for any other cameras to do that and it's need of the r so i'll conclude my presentation here due to the shortage of time and one thing i'll basically uh, like to tell this is a evidence based treatment so i am able to tell my patient that this is the evidence you have uh, in your eye that this problem is there in your eye this is evidence i even i am able to give them evidence that i have treated you whether the treatment has happened or not if anything is wrong even you are able to see this is the evidence so this evidence based treatment is possible only with this ultra wide field imaging thank you thank you part for this uh, last bit uh, you really drive the point home uh, and uh, i must say that uh, we are a little over time so uh, quickly uh, as an outsider i can just summarize a few uh, Uh, basic points of uh, this uh, entire evening sorry we cannot take up any questions 
because we are run out of time, but the entire bouquet of uh, ultra wide field imaging that we had was truly mesmerizing, presented by all the best presenters. And uh, let us understand that this is a technology which is going to go forward because it uses a laser which has very good penetration and uh, it can penetrate through hazy media and it is, it is being reconstituted very properly. And uh, the very basic thing that it creates a virtual point of these laser just in front of the pupil, in front of the lens. And so you can have this ultra wide field imaging. So this very concept, which comes from an ellipsoid mirror and the noises that are there in the periphery or the distortions that has been taken care of. I mean, this is a phenomenal work. Now, obviously as, uh, Mr. Anderson himself said that it is a technology which is costly and uh, but again when we start using it and when we start putting it in economies of scale uh, as has been evident from the discussions by so many uh, retina specialists that a hurried retinal examination probably misses a lot of things which will not be missed on ultra wide field and your uh, imaging. The second important thing is now there are convergences coming in. Like the California system had the ICG and the angiography. The uh, DX200 model had an angiography. A simpler model is there as Daytona. Now Silverstone is coming, which has swept source OCT with it. Can you imagine that you having the entire uh, swept source uh, image of the entire retina? So, I mean, it could, it is a totally paradigm shift uh, and it is available for a comprehensive ophthalmologist, a cataract surgeon, a refractive surgeon. He doesn't want to have his retina colleague beside every time. And uh, the clinic procedures can move on so smoothly. So, all this package together and now we have Nikon to help us uh, take the thing forward because definitely inventors are inventors and Douglas Anderson has done his job. He's done an excellent job and now it is for us to take it forward and uh, I definitely am sure that Nikon will do this because it was not very well represented in India. Uh, Cheng might have different opinions because we used to uh, rely uh, on a lot of uh, support from uh, Singapore and Australia and even in from China uh, to maintain our machines. But now that Nikon is here, I'm sure that we will be taken care of uh, very well. And uh, Nikon is very well represented through uh, CMI, Cornell Medical uh, uh, Instruments. And uh, uh, I thank them for uh, bringing this wonderful thing into light today. And uh, I hope Deepak is here. Deepak, would you uh, add a few comments before we part? Uh, I can only thank du uh, Deepak Gunwant for uh, this wonderful meeting. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, this is a valuable discussion. Really appreciated your comments. Uh, I would just uh, request the doctors to come forward and talk to us. The pricing matters we have already addressed uh, too much with Nikon and Optos. The biggest issue in India is, is approximately 30% custom duty and GST. Uh, I mean, and now the freight charges, the consignment is coming from Scotland. There are very limited flights available. Uh, so we are trying to accommodate and we would like to see grow. I mean, like Singapore, I mean, I mean, if you see the small country, we are we have much bigger fold in our hand. We have a lot of big specialties, big populations, and we would like to have your, your kind of experience shared to the doctors. I mean, you are legendary people, and thank you so much, all of your sharing, all of your experience. Thank you so much. Thank you, Deepak. And uh, uh, one uh, small comment, one minute from uh, Dr. Cheng, and finally, from Dr. Dogra. I, I'm, I think uh, I'm the 
outsider here actually. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay, but I really thank you uh, for all the uh, the thank the invitation and the warm greetings and I bring greetings from Singapore. I hope everybody stay safe and uh, yeah and uh, stay healthy as well. And wish you a wonderful year ahead. Can you thank just you. tell me how many uh, optos uh, do you have in Singapore? Any idea? Um, I have no idea. I could tell you that I probably about ten. Actually, not many actually. And uh, you're right that uh, a lot of the optometry uh, uh, shops are actually picking them up rather than the clinics itself. Yeah. So, uh, Ken for 45 million people. And Deepak, how many do we have in India now? We have 28 restoration varieties. So, uh, we have a long way to go. Uh, over to Dr. Mangat. I think uh, uh, one of the reasons uh, why uh, probably there was a reluctance earlier we had a big problem with the service. You see, once uh, the machine went out of order, so many people, even the big institution, they were hassled. So that was a big, because uh, along with Dr. Debashish, we were the one who acquired these machines very early and we have uh, experienced right from early at time. And we were lucky that our machines did uh, well, but that didn't happen everywhere. So that was one of the major problem earlier, which in fact would, has been solved. And uh, we know it with the, this Detona coming in. You see, especially that time, uh, there was nothing like this uh, Detona kind of a machine. It was that big, huge uh, machine, 200X. Uh, and uh, that was a uh, type of machine which uh, required, and there was nothing like uh, only, of course, that did ice and angiography also, as well as, uh, of course, uh, it, it performed very well. But now with uh, Detona coming in, and as, of course, a bigger institution would have uh, finally, not only California, but the Silverstone also in the, uh, down the line. But the service part is very important. If you improve that, I think we're going to definitely have more installation because that is what perhaps in this country that time, it was badly mouthed that if you install it and if, it, if something went wrong, nobody would take care of that. That is what happened right. in earlier. So, so that I is what I would just say. One minute. So yes. the service protocol of Nikon is very, very good. You know, I mean, they, we, 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 before selling even silver stone, the important part is the training. So we have yes. to see all the calibrated tools. See, this is US FDA products. So we have to do the all protocols to be checked as per Nikon. And if you, I, I don't know if you are aware of even your 200 TX, you know, which is, which was bad for a long time. We, we worked that. Now you have two systems working for a long time. For more than one year, when you purchase California, we get it rectified during that time. It's working fine. And, and we have not I, charged anything. We have not yes, charged. Anything. Absolutely. We appreciate. In fact, our 200, that machine is still working in PGI. And I think uh, it was done by uh, subsequently your team. And that's a great thing that uh, uh, everything was done. But what I'm saying is, I think with that, we'll have more installation and we know how much are the advantages. And in fact, it is Dr. Devashis, who's not even a retina person. He kind of uh, really gave that gist that how useful this machine is, as well as uh, his own place. And he has put so much of confidence on this machine, which in fact, I absolutely echo. And that is what is going to happen. So we'll definitely have more and more people installing this machine. And because it is very useful, not only for uh, what we talked here, but even uh, we'll get probably more indications. We'll get more insight into what all we can do once we use more and more. So that is what we will know in future. Thank you very much. I think all good things have to come to an end and we are already 15 minutes late past schedule. Thank you, everybody. And uh, have a nice evening and a weekend. Thank you. Thank you. So Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.